This evening we are uh, in the book of Colossians, if you'd like to uh, turn that up. Colossians chapter 3, continuing a study basically on why it is we should put our sins to death and why we should uh, put on the righteous works of our Lord Jesus Christ, why we should uh, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for our flesh with regard to its lusts. Another reason or motive is given to us in Colossians chapter 3. And I'd like to um, read verses 1 through 7, although we're going to be focusing mainly on verses 1 through 3. And I think you're going to see a very um, familiar theme in this passage, the one we actually began with from uh, the book of Romans, I believe, where Paul reminded us that when Jesus died, we died with him. When he rose, we rose with him. Therefore, we should consider ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. Paul writes in Colossians 3, If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things above, that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is account on, of these things that the wrath of God will come. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. I should really continue. Let me just read a few, couple more verses. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. Again, the idea being, since you've died, put off the old man, which is dead, since you've been raised again to life, put on Christ, put on the new man. If that is true, of you, if that has happened with you, if you've been raised up with Christ, seek the things above, not the things that are on the earth. Now, again, I'm probably going to end up reviewing all these things again as we look at our introduction. We have been looking at something, and what I've just read actually already is true of you. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ this evening, the fact is you are dead You died with Christ when he died. And you are dead to sin. You are basically dead to your old way of living. The Lord has put within your heart a desire not to live the way that you used to live. Now your old man may still want to live in that particular way, the sin that's inside of you, but the new you, the real you, doesn't want to live the way you used to live because there is a new principle of life. When you were raised with Christ, when he was raised from the dead, you were raised to life also in him. And you have that new principle at work in you that desires the Lord and wants to do his will. Now that is a fact. That's something that's already happened to you and a desire that you already have if you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, we've also seen that even though that may be true, You still need motivation. We all need motivation to continue in that direction. So we have been looking at motives. Why you should put your sins to death. Why you should put on Christ. And the first motive was that which comes from faith. If you were to go the direction that the saints went, such as the Apostle Paul or the other apostles who actually lay down their lives for the kingdom of heaven, you have to be able to see what they saw. And actually, the Lord has given to you faith that enables you to see that. 
to see something which is far better than what you see here on earth, to see the promises of God actually fulfilled. Remember, faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith gives substance to those things which you can't see because they're still future, but makes them as real to you as though they're in front of you. The stronger your faith, the more clearly you'll see them, and the more you'll go that direction. Now, that was the first thing that moves you to put your sins to death and to live to God. But the second thing was love. And we noted that if God has actually opened your eyes to see these things, he has also given you love. He's given you a faith that works by love. He has given you a desire for the things that you see. By the way, one of the things you see by faith is also the Lord Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, yet you love because the Spirit of God in you shows you Christ and causes you to love him. You have a love for what is good, at the same time a hatred for what is evil. So seeing these things that God promises, the things he reveals in his word, and wanting these things, it compels you, it moves you forward to pursue these things so that you might gain Christ. It moves you to put your sins to death, to get everything out of the way that stands in your way, and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ so you can actually advance towards heaven. Now, as I've said, these are two principles that God has already created in your soul. You can see these invisible things by faith, and you already love these things. That's the reason why you came to Jesus in the first place is because you saw him in his offer, in his word, in his gospel, and you desired him that way of salvation, and you received him, and you turned from your sins, and you began to walk with him. So that principle is already there. The evidence that it is is the fact that you've trusted Jesus in the first place. But just because those principles are there doesn't, again, mean that you don't need encouragement to grow in these things and to pursue these things. Because you do have a principle working in your heart against these things. Um, I know the Lord has his purpose for allowing the sin that remains in us to remain there. And I can't really speak against God's will because that's what he has planned to do. That's what he has, in fact, done. But it is tragic that it's there. Because sin is constantly working against you and me as far as our pursuit of these things trying to blind us to the things that we can see by faith and trying to put out the love that we have for them so that we won't pursue them. And that's why, again, we, as we've seen, we need the means of grace so that our faith may be strengthened and our love may be strengthened to move ahead to pursue these things. But realizing that sin is working against you and that its ultimate goal is to destroy your soul, and sin would do that. Sin is hatred of God. Sin is hatred of you. Sin would, if it had its will, take you and cast you into hell, into the lake of fire, and rejoice over it. That's, that's what's in your heart that is making you want the things of the world, realizing that that is the case, and it's making you not want the things above. That's another reason why you'll actually want to kill it. The Lord tells you that you need to kill it. Matter of fact, he says, if you don't kill that sin, that sin's going to kill you. But thankfully, God has given you the tools to put it to death, to weaken it, and he's given you the command to do it. And we're actually going to uh, consider that in one of the, uh, the future sermons. So again, we're looking at reasons why we should want to kill this sin. And it's because it is stopping us, it is hindering us from moving forward. So tonight we want to add another motive, another reason why it is you should seek to kill your sin, to die to sin, and to live to God. And the reason is because you have been raised up with Christ and are already seated with him in heaven, and because that is ultimately where you want to be. Now tonight I want us to consider two things. First of all, that which the Bible tells us is already a reality in your life and in my life, if we're believers in Christ, and that is that you have been raised up with Christ and are seated with him in the heavenly places. 
And then secondly, we want to look at the command. Since you have been raised up with Christ, you are to set your mind on the things that are above and not the things that are on earth. So first of all, let's consider what the Bible says is already a reality in your life if you have trusted Jesus, and that is having been raised up with the Lord Jesus Christ, you are already seated with him in the heavenly places. Now he begins by saying this, if you have been raised up with Christ. Now basically that is a condition which has been met in every believer. Something that I believe Paul is assuming in, in, his, in what he writes to his audience, assuming to be true. If in fact you have been raised up with Christ, then this is what you need to be doing. But again, that's what comes before this. We're not going to have a chance to look at it. The fact is, if they've trusted Jesus, they have been raised up with him. And that's something that's also true of you. If you're a believer here this evening, that you have been raised up with the Lord Jesus Christ, as we already saw. When he died, you died with him. When he was raised, you were raised with him. When you are united to Christ by faith, Whatever it is that Jesus went through, he went through for you, and you went through it with him. You know, we talk again about how Jesus bore our sins on the cross. I was just talking with uh, Jeremy about this earlier to, uh, to, uh, this morning, this afternoon, actually, that when Jesus died on the cross, he actually had Jeremy's sins laid on him actually had uh, each one of our sins laid on him if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. He had the sins of all of his people laid on him. They were imputed to him, and he suffered in the place of you and me on the cross. And the reason why God poured his wrath out upon him there was because he was paying for our sins. But Jesus took our place not only on the cross, he took our place in his obedience he took our place in his death and his burial. He took our place in his resurrection. And, <clears throat> importantly for this evening, he took our place uh, in his ascension into heaven and being seated at the right hand of God. Now, what this means is if you were trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, not only were you raised with him, but you've also actually been, uh, you've already ascended with him into heaven and are seated with him. I know that sounds kind of strange because we are sitting here in this building looking at one another and the things of the world and it doesn't look like we're in heaven, so how can we say that we're actually seated with Christ in heaven? Well, Paul tells us that that is where we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. In his letter to the Ephesians, after pointing out that you and I and everybody else who is a believer at one time uh, was not, that we were actually born dead in sin and that we were uh, walking after the prince of the power of the air, after the prince of this world, we were doing what Satan wanted us to do in his kingdom and that you were a child of wrath because you were in the kingdom of Satan and doing his will, even as the rest of the world. He goes on to say this in Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us, in Christ Jesus. Basically what Paul is saying here is that just as you died and were raised with him, <clears throat> so you have ascended into heaven with him. Your Lord is seated in heaven. That's where Jesus is. When he ascended into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And heaven will receive him till the fullness of time when he returns again. But right now he's in heaven. And because you are united with him by faith, you are in heaven as well. That is a reality. Okay, it's a principle, you might say, but it's something which is true of you because of your union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as his obedience is yours, 
which actually saves you and makes you just. And just as your sins have been imputed to him on the cross, so you are with him in heaven. Now, we need to understand that if we're going to get Paul's point here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. And what is Paul actually saying? What he's saying here is this, that, that if, if that is where you are in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have been raised up with him, not just from death to life, but actually up into heaven, then that is where you will want to be. That is where your heart is going to be, in heaven and not on earth. And if that is where your heart is, that's where your mind is going to be as well, because you know as well as I do, you think about the things you desire most of all. When you want something, that's really all you can think about, right? If you want something badly, that's, you get your mind fixed on it, you think about it, you scheme about ways to get it, and you think about it until you get it, and if it's something that has to do with this world, you usually get it and you get tired of it in a few weeks and it's no, no big deal anymore. If it's a place that you want to go, you think about that place until you actually arrive there. And then, of course, you find out, well, it might be fun for a while, but not everything you hoped it would be. If it's a person that you want to be with, you fix your mind on that person until you're actually with them. Now, if you're a believer this evening, your heart is actually with the Lord. God has put a principle within your heart. And you love him, in essence, more than anything else in this world. Which is why you would rather be with him in heaven than on this earth. That's really true of every true believer. Now, before you panic and say, you know what, sometimes I struggle with that. Sometimes I really don't feel like that. Maybe I don't feel like that much at all. But you have to realize that even though that principle is in your heart, there are at least two things that are working against you that keeps that desire from being as strong as it might otherwise be. And the first thing, of course, is the sin that's inside your heart. There is a part of you that doesn't want you to love the things above, that doesn't want you to think about heaven, that wants you to focus on the things that are in this world and the things of this world because it almost seems to have a mind of its own. As I've told you, it's, it's pure hatred against God. It's, it's a love for the things of the world, and it knows that if you focus your mind on heaven, that you're going to do some things that are going to hurt it and make it weaker, and that will eventually kill it, which is exactly what the Lord tells us to do. And so out of self-preservation, this sin works overtime to try to dangle the world in front of your eyes and to continually draw your mind toward the things of the world and to play the world up while playing heaven down through a variety of ways. I just thought of a few things that it might entice you with. For one thing, heaven's still a long ways off. Why don't you just enjoy the world while you can? There's so much to enjoy here after all. I mean, didn't God make it? Didn't he intend for you to enjoy these things? You only have one opportunity. You only live once. So make sure you do everything you want to do before you die, right? Don't waste your time by pursuing something as it gets a little bit darker that really isn't true. And your flesh will tell you that. Sin will tell you that. What you want isn't really that bad after all. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where God says, I can't have this, I can't have that, I can't do these things. But it presents to you arguments to draw you into the world and to get your mind off of heaven, even though heaven is really where you want to be as a Christian. So this is the first thing that's working against you, is the sin that's inside of you. Now the second thing is this, that this desire that God has put within your heart is not something that just works automatically. I mean, it's not as strong as it can be just because it's there, or as strong as it should be. Sometimes it actually gets quite weak to the point where you're not even sure that it's even there. I think you know by now that the Christian life is not something that God means to kind of work on its own, something that just goes automatically. You just kind of wind it up and, and let it go a particular direction. 
God, when he put love in your heart, did not so fill you with love and just consume your life with love that it pushed all your sin out of the way so that all you want to do is obey him. That's not the way it works. The Christian life is a constant struggle. That's the way that God has planned it. A warfare between your flesh and between the Spirit of God who dwells in your heart, making you want to do the right thing. It is a battle that you have to be engaged in at all times if you are to win. So in other words, just because the Lord has put a desire in your heart for heaven doesn't mean that you're always going to be thinking about heaven in the way that you should be and not about the things of the world. There is going to be a struggle. But the fact that he has given you that desire is what actually makes the struggle take place. The flesh just wants the world, but the spirit within you wants heaven. And so the struggle is there. But because the struggle is there, there is also the possibility of winning that battle and doing what it is that God actually commands you to do so that you can win that battle. And that's what we want to consider secondly. The first thing is that God has, in fact, um, raised you up with Christ and seated you with Christ in the heavenly places. And what that means is not only that um, being united to Christ, you're actually there, but it also means that you have a desire in your heart to be there. That's what makes, again, the second point possible. The ability to fulfill the command that God gives to you in this passage to the Apostle Paul. Again, let's read uh, what our text says. If you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, you do have an enemy that is working against you, as I've already said. And the possibility exists that you will not pursue these things the way that you should. And because that's true, God gives you a command. This is what you are to do. And you can do it because God has given you the desire to do it. I mean, a command that's issued like this to a person who doesn't know the Lord, he's not going to have any ability to do this at all. He doesn't want to do it, but you want to because you're a believer. You have the desire to be in heaven. And so you have what you need for this to be fulfilled. But let's remember that God gives you this command because of the struggle that's going on. He doesn't want you to remain in limbo. He doesn't want you forever to be struggling. He wants you to advance. And that's why he gives you this command. But exactly what is God telling you to do here? Because, I mean, God has placed things in the world that aren't necessarily bad. It's not that he doesn't want us to enjoy some of the things that he's given to us while we're here. What exactly is the Lord telling us to do? Well, first of all, he tells you to take your mind off the things that are on the earth. Does that mean everything absolutely? Well, no, not necessarily. So what things are we supposed to avoid here? Well, two things in general. I think the first one's quite obvious, the things that are sinful. You need to avoid those. But there's also those things that aren't necessarily sinful, but they can become sin if you love them too much. Uh, one example of that would be, again, with the rich young ruler. I mean, the fact that he had riches, it's not sinful to have riches. It's not sinful to have wealth. I mean, if I have a dollar, if it's not a sin for me to have a dollar, it's not going to be sinful for me to have a million dollars, right? There's nothing evil about that itself unless that thing takes hold of your heart and causes you to, to focus on the things on the earth, then it becomes a problem. The author to the Hebrews basically warns us of two things that we have to be willing to let go if we are going to run the race that the Lord calls us to run, the same race that was run by the faithful in chapter 11 of Hebrews, the, what we call the hall of faith, all those people who actually did what the Lord wanted them to do and, and achieved heaven. He begins chapter 12 with these words, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, that is, all these people who lived the life of faith in chapter 11, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance 
the race that is set before us. Now, the reason I read that passage is because he puts his finger on the same two things that I just mentioned. The sin which so easily entangles us and anything that encumbers you or makes it difficult for you to run the race. Now, sin, as I've said, is, is very easy to understand. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is everything God forbids in his law. Sin is doing the thing God, or doing whatever God tells us not to do and not doing things that he tells us to do. Those are the things, of course, we have to be willing to get rid of when he says, lay aside the sin which so easily entangles us. If we're going to take our minds off the things of the earth so that we'll run towards heaven, we have to detach our hearts from sin, things that are clearly against God's will. Now, the second category of those encumbrances, it's not really hard to define, but some of these things can be hard to let go of. The things that aren't necessarily sinful, but that become sin because they gain too much ground in our hearts. We desire them too much. I've made reference to this several times, but again, Pilgrim's Progress. Vanity Fair. What is Vanity Fair? Well, as Bunyan, in, as he's narrating the whole dream and the story, he explains it as they're entering into the town. He says that here are things lawful and things that are unlawful that could tempt pilgrims out of the way to Zion and to settle instead in Vanity Fair, which is a picture of the world. Encumbrances are those things which aren't sinful, but again become sinful because you love them too much. The things that get in your way when you want to do something spiritual. You know, instead of doing what the Lord wants you to do in order to build yourself up in Christ, it's that thing that tempts you out of the way. Of course, that could be just about anything, because your flesh is always going to be trying to divert you, but that thing is going to get most in your way. Those things that get in your way when you want to serve the Lord. Instead of serving the Lord, I'll just go and to my default and I'll do this instead because I'm addicted to it or I'm captivated by it. Those things that take hold of your mind so that that's what you're thinking about and your heart, that's what you want that isn't really related to the kingdom of heaven. By the way, it's also those things that you believe to be sinful, even if they're not really sinful. If you think they are and you're still willing to do them, the Lord says, whatever is not of faith is sin. Now, the Lord tells you that you have to set sin aside, but also the things that get in your way. Remember how um, Susanna Wesley, again, I think this is a great piece of wisdom. When she said, what is sin to you may not be a sin to someone else. And she was talking about encumbrances here, not the things that are clearly sinful that God actually defines in his word. But she says, anything that takes away your desire for heavenly things, your desire for spiritual things, it cools off your zeal for God, whatever that thing is. For you, that's sin, and you should avoid it. If you really love the Lord, are you going to pour water on that love to try to quench it? And yet, if there's something you're doing that actually quenches that love, do you want to keep pouring it on your heart? Not if you love the Lord. You've got to set that aside along with every other sin. If you are going to run the race with endurance and make it towards heaven, if you don't do this, I think the implied um, answer in, in the book of Hebrews is you're not going to succeed. You're going to get tangled up. You're going to become ensnared. You're not going to make it to heaven. Like I said before, if you don't kill sin, sin will kill you. But thankfully, God will not allow sin to kill any of his children. He will cause them to fight against it, to set the sin aside, to uh, set aside those encumbrances. Sometimes he does it by giving you so much of it that you get sick of it and you finally say, I want to be done with it, and then you begin to pursue those things. That's sometimes how the Lord works. But whether, whether he gives us over to those sins or not, the duty is still there. Give up the sin and the encumbrances so that you can run towards heaven. So that's what it means to take your eyes off the things of the world, not to have your mind set there. Rather, you are to seek the things which are above, where Christ is, to set your mind on the things above. Now, what is exactly is, is he telling us to do here? Well, certainly, it means, first of all, 
that you are to love the Lord most of all. That He is to be the foremost in your thoughts. The one that, that you think about because you love. Remember how we looked at before about the fact if you really love someone, you'll think about them. If you really want something, you'll think about that thing. If you really want to go somewhere, you'll think about that place. Well, if you really love Jesus, you will think about Jesus. So it's easy to say that we love him, but ask yourself this question. How much do you really think about him? And can you really say that you love him if you can go hour after hour, day after day, or even week after week without ever giving him a thought? If you're going to set your mind on heaven, you have to love the Lord. Of course, you do if you're a believer. But sometimes you have to be reminded, I need to think about Jesus more. It also means to set your mind on the people of God, the ones you're going to be spending eternity with in heaven. If you love Jesus, aren't you also going to love those who are his, those who are becoming more like Jesus? And can you really say that you love Jesus if you don't really ever think about your brothers and sisters in Christ or pray for them? Or when you're with them, try to build them up as best you can in Christ and encourage them towards heaven? Setting your mind on the things of heaven has also to do with setting your mind on your brothers and sisters, the body of Christ. I mean, we are his body, as we saw this morning, and doing what we can to love them and to minister to them. It means setting your mind on the Father and thinking about whether or not the things you're doing are honoring to him. Setting your mind on the Spirit of God and whether or not you're obeying him rather than doing the things that quench and grieve him. It means reading his word with faith to believe what it says and with the commitment to do what the Lord actually calls you to do in his word. It means desiring his kingdom so that whatever you do, you do to advance the kingdom of heaven throughout your entire life. It also means setting your mind on heaven itself where your Lord is, and living and working as one who is actually heading to that place in everything that you do, offering yourself up as a living sacrifice to the Lord, saying basically, Lord, what do you want me to do this day? How, what do you want me to eat? What do you want me to drink? How do you want me to live? How do you want me to do what I do today for your glory? And how can I do it better? It means seeking to glorify and honor the Lord while you're here so that you might reign with him forever in heaven. So basically, to seek the things above means to have these things on your heart and in your mind rather than the things of the world. Now again, if you're a believer, you know that this is what you want to do. It's, it's, if you're the rich young ruler, you know, I mean, think of yourself in his place. And ask yourself this question. If Jesus Christ came to you and he said, I want you to take everything you have and sell it and give it to the poor and follow me, would you be able to do it? Is there anything in this world that has your heart so engrossed that you can't give it up for Jesus? See, those are the things that he wants you to give up, to give to him, so that your treasure will not be in this world but rather will be on the things of heaven. And if you're a believer this evening, that is exactly what you want. And it's not that you're not going to struggle. We all will struggle with the things of this world, but we will we'll win that struggle. And we will overcome our affection for those things. And we will love the Lord more, and we will pursue those things. We will submit to this command to turn from the world and to seek the things above. And along with every other sin, you will put them all to death. I mean, basically we're talking about putting your sins to death because that's what are the, those are the things that draw your heart into the world. Putting those sins to death and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is setting your heart on the things above. The Lord presents that same dichotomy, as it were, or that same parallel uh, duty in several different ways. Don't set your heart on the, on the things that are on the earth, but rather set your hearts in heaven is the same thing as saying, put your sins to death and put on righteousness.
that is what you'll want to do if you're a believer. You will desire the things above enough to put to death those things, those desires in the world that will keep your heart down here. Now, if you're not a believer, you're not going to be able to do this because the only things you want are actually the things in this world that Jesus tells you that you need to give up. And if that's where you are this evening, then you need to pray that God would break the hold that sin has on your heart and give you basically the grace you need, the love you need to be able to submit to this command, to forsake the world and your sin and to fix your eyes upon heaven and to run that way. Well, may the Lord give each of us the grace to do this. This is what our God calls us to do. This, again, if you're a believer, this is what you want to do. So you should hope God gives you grace to do it better and better each day. And if you're not a believer, you need this grace. Because if you don't have this grace, you're not going to be able to reach heaven. You have to desire to be there before you're actually going to arrive there. And only the Lord can give it to you. So you need to ask him for that mercy. Again, may the Lord give each of us grace to do that, especially as we consider coming to the Lord's table. Jesus gave up his life. He died on the cross in order to break the power of sin, in order to break the hold the world had on you so that you might desire heaven and might actually one day be there with him. Let's spend a few moments in prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us sort through our hearts to see where we're at as uh, we begin to look toward the Lord's Supper uh, to come to it. Let's spend a few moments in prayer.